I told the students I would make myself vulnerable and I would tell a story both to let our judges have a moment to look over the rubric they're going to use um, in judging these stories um, and just to talk about an ending in my life. Okay, um, so here we go. And, and I'm even gonna get timed, and I bet I go over time and you won't, but I'm gonna try my best to, to make sure we have, um, one of our English teachers tonight, Virginia Warfield, is helping us keep our storytellers on track. And we have Mrs. Sochua, our library assistant, who's gonna be helping with the math scores. And I'm gonna get to these judges here in just a minute. Okay, so. I had a time in my life almost exactly eight years ago when I thought my career as a teacher librarian was going to come to an end. So I have to back up a little bit to tell you why this felt so devastating to me. Because when I moved out to Portland, I wasn't quite sure what was it that I wanted to do with my life. I left a job in North Carolina at Oxford University Press where I was an editorial assistant. And I moved out here after getting married at the Graceland Wedding Chapel in Las Vegas and was ready to start a new life. My husband got a job right away, but I just was kind of stuck. And I couldn't really find anything in publishing and I didn't know what I was gonna do. And then I thought, well, you know, I have these two English degrees. I can go back to school and I can um, get a teaching certificate and teach high school English. Um, there I was though at, at the dinner table one night and I said to my husband, I don't know, I'm just feeling really um, unsure. Is this what I'm meant to be? And he said, have you ever considered being a school librarian because Portland State, where you're going to go for your teacher program, has library classes. And it was an epiphany. The heavens broke open, the light shined down. Ah, school librarian, yes, that is what I want to do. I immediately signed up for library classes and the very first class I took was a library practicum in the Marshall High School Library with Gail Miyagi as my mentor teacher librarian. She did a fabulous job and she and her husband Roger, sitting on our judging panel, um, over these last 21 years have been amazing mentors and offering advice at different points in my life, particularly when I became a parent um, for the first time. Um, so everything started off great. I had a great practicum. I got through my program. I got a job right away at Jefferson High School and life was wonderful as a school librarian. But then I had an opportunity come up. A friend of mine that I, I had met in that library program at Portland State worked over in the Evergreen School District and his school district was opening a brand new high school and um, they were gonna need a teacher librarian for that high school and he was recommending me. It sounded amazing, a once in a lifetime opportunity to go to a school, um, get to choose all of the opening day collection, build a library program from the ground up. I just couldn't say no. So it was with a heavy heart um, my time at Jefferson High School came to an end, but a new beginning started at Union High School. And there I was for four years commuting over the Columbia River and thinking, this is my life. I will be working in Washington as a teacher librarian until the day that I get to retire. But then the recession came along and my school district was struggling to get a budget put together, and their solution was, we'll just cut all of the teacher librarians. And so there I was, thinking to myself, I think my time as a teacher librarian might be coming to an end. But I reached back out to my friends in Portland Public to let them know what was happening with me 
and I got a call one day um, in the middle of the Nordstrom anniversary sale as I stood at the cash register. My phone rang and I looked down and realized it was one of my teacher librarian friends and she was calling to say there is a job opening at Grant High School. I applied, I got the job. The very first teacher I was introduced to was Pardis Nobby over here on our judging panel. The very first student I ever met was her daughter, the lovely Lily, love it. Um, and that was eight years ago. So even though it was very bittersweet to have to leave behind Union High School in this program that I had helped develop, um, Grant had been a school that I had always held in really high regard and was very happy to get the chance to come here. Um, and here we are full circle back in the Marshall Library where it all began, but as we know, our time here is coming to an end. Um, for some of us that feels a little bittersweet, um, and for others of us we are woohoo ready to go back to Northeast Portland. Um, but what, uh, even though it, it feels a little bittersweet to leave this library that helped launch this career that I've loved so much. Um, it's the time here has provided the opportunity to meet some new people. And one of those is Jordan, who works at the Powell's on Hawthorne, where I think I go about once a week to pick up books for this library and to get to um, encourage our students to attend his book club meetings that they have there. So with every ending comes new beginnings. Um, so I'm very excited to see what our beginning back at Remodeled Grant will bring us. So thank you. And I know I went over time. <laughs> 5.49, it is possible. It's possible. All right. I got it done in the grace period, yes. Okay, so we have five storytellers tonight. Our um, first storyteller, when I asked them, um, okay, so things are coming to an end here at Marshall. What will you miss about this campus and be still my heart? They said, I'm going to miss this library space because this is where I have competed in Story Slam, Poetry Slam, and Poetry Out Loud. So please welcome to the microphone, Danny. It was nine o'clock on a Friday night in Cartersville, Georgia. I was there with my 10-year-old brother, my mom, and my dad in the woods about a quarter mile behind our house. <laughs> it was autumn, so the temperature was brisk, but not yet freezing, perfect toady weather, and we were all gathered around the campfire, uh, me, my family, and the firefighters. Uh, the firefighters were there because they had received a call from one of our concerned neighbors. Our neighbors had made such a call because when I say campfire, what I really mean is bonfire. This fire was huge. The flames themselves went up 10 feet in the air. The smoke extended up another 30 at least. And I was praying. Now, I was the most secular 12-year-old boy you could find in North Georgia, but I was just praying that the firefighters would not put out our fire and find the 65-pound burning dog carcass that lay within. <laughs> Let me flash back six years. My family and I move into a beautiful house in Cartersville, Georgia, the house is three stories tall. We have nearly an acre of land, including a backyard, huge backyard, that would later have a playset built, my, built by my dad and a garden tended by my mom. Outside of our own property was a young neighborhood with expansive woods, a pond, a pool, a creek, tennis courts, annoying neighbors, everything. And it was perfect, except we were missing a dog. I was six years old at the time and wanted a dog more than anything, but my four-year-old brother was skinny enough to be knocked down by strong winds, so a rambunctious large dog was not an option. But a small dog like a Shih Tzu or a Chihuahua wasn't an option either, because like I said, I wanted a dog. <laughs> but w one day, we got lucky. Walking around a fair, uh, we found this beautiful rescue dog. She was part yellow lab, part German shepherd. And she was big, but docile enough that she wouldn't accidentally eat my sibling. We adopted her and named her Abby. Ironically, she sat in my brother's lap the entire car ride home, effectively cutting off his respiratory system. I was overjoyed. <laughs> now, some people treat their pets like pets, right? They lock them outside at night, they don't let them on the furniture, but 
Abby was treated like family in our house. She slept where she wanted, napped where she wanted, and ate as much as she wanted thanks to our gravity feeder. We would take her for long walks around the neighborhood with no leash because once she got to know us, she had no reason to leave. And remember those woods I mentioned behind our house? Those were her second home. At some point in my childhood, my dad purchased a Gator, this large four-wheeler type vehicle, and we would just ride around in it in the woods, literally paving trails that we would enjoy for years. And she, Abby enjoyed them just as much as we did. She would run alongside the Gator, barking and wagging her tail, following us wherever. Sometimes we would return from a trip to the supermarket and find her not even in the house, because it turns out she didn't even need us to go for a trip in the backwoods. She was there for almost every childhood memory I have. She was semi-responsible for two of my most memorable childhood injuries. I played with her and I rubbed her belly. She ran and she romped and she ate and she slept hard. She lived her entire life with the spirit of someone who knew they only had a few years on earth and wanted to make the most of them before they were gone. So naturally when she died, a professionally performed legal cremation was not an option. We put her in a wheelbarrow and rolled her out to those woods about a quarter mile behind our house and gave her a classic Viking send off. Her last meal was a pound and a half steak that my mom cooked just for her. And her last act was to burn up in a flame so big that the neighbors thought there was a wildfire. Nothing could be more fitting really for a dog so grand. The firefighters left soon after realizing nothing was wrong. And after Abby finished burning, we left her ashes there in the woods. She lived with us for almost the entire time we were at that house, and we moved soon after her death. Whether there was any correlation, I doubt, but I do know that the house felt empty without her, and the woods definitely lost some of their majesty. Anyone who has had a pet like that knows what a pleasure it is to witness someone who truly knows how to be alive. And the full beauty of who she was as a dog has led me to fall in love with her name unlike any other, Abby. So I really hope I have a daughter someday. Thank you. <laughs> Thanks, Danny. Uh, now I'm all up in my feels. When we prepare for the story slam, I have the students uh, come in so they can meet one another. Sometimes they come without quite having an idea of what they want to tell their story about. And uh, we run through it and then we have a dress rehearsal and we, we do the story again. And all of these storytellers have been so collaborative and supportive of one another and give each other feedback. But we had never heard the very end of that story. So that's why I'm like, this is why I have tissues by my chair over there. So wiping the tears away. Um, what's that? Okay, I'm trying to tap dance up here so we give our judges enough time to give scores. Um, how many people in the audience are dog people? Obviously these two up front, we know that. We got some dog people. Who are our cat people? Oh, we ha okay, some people like both. All right, yes, I, I have had both dogs and cats, but um, classic library lady, um, I'm going with the cats. So there you have it. All right, judges, how are we doing? Looking good. You're gonna be fine, you'll be fine. Jordan did this last year as well, so you'll be fine. Okay, so our next storyteller, uh, I had said, what will you miss the most about your time at Marshall coming to an end? And uh, they mentioned how this building is very easy to navigate because it's just a big square. And so even if you have headed the wrong direction towards the classroom you're supposed to be at. As long as you just keep going in a clockwise fashion, you are going to be able to find where you're supposed to be. So please welcome to the microphone, Jordan. Some people have endings that come very emotionally or very rough, and it can be unexpected 
where we don't expect something to have such an emotional tie to it. And when you have these emotional ties, you need to find something to lift that pressure off of your shoulders. And the way I did that was with even more pressure and more intensity, I did CrossFit. I do the CrossFit program here at Grant, which is run by Miss Gardner, who is an amazing teacher and pushes everyone to strive to do their best and grow and be a healthier and just in general have a great workout. And with that pressuring, or not pressuring, but pushing yourselves to strive farther, she does competitions. And it's not just us, it's Cleveland as well, which has the other program that's even nicer than ours. Um, um, we do competitions that raise money for our program so we can have new equipment and new weights. And with that, you have to have a partner. And with your partner, you can choose the intensity you want to work at where it can be a very high intensity or it can be a more lower intensity that won't kill you. Um, and so I had trouble in the past trying to find someone to be my partner. And when I finally did, I was happy to know that I already knew them. They were at the track team that I also, compete, eh, that I also competed in. And it wasn't awkward, but we still knew each other so we could compete soundly together. And when we got to the competition, it was a nice day. It was a little rainy out, but it was still a great day to have a nice, intense workout. And we started going, and we weren't going at a level where it was going to make us explode into infinity, but it was manageable where we were still sweating. And we're doing a bunch of workouts. We're doing pull-ups, we're doing front squats, we're doing back squats, we're just doing jump ropes that leave the worst marks on your arms. And it comes to the final wad and we're just going, we're doing pull-ups, your arms are starting to hurt, your hands are covered in chalk, just so you can keep your hands on the bar. And we are eventually done, the time cap is done, the timer goes off, and we can relax. It was the end of our day where our workout has finally come to a nice closure. We started stretching, we started to cool down, and my partner decided to leave. So as they leave, I decide, okay, I'll just ask and cheer on the rest of my teammates who are working just as hard as I was. As I'm cheering them on, a few of my teammates come up to me and ask, hey, have you checked the leaderboard? Which I have not because I thought we were working that hard, so I expected, eh, we didn't do terribly good, but might as well look. I look at the leaderboard and I didn't know that we were third place. And like our name, oh my wad, I was freaking out. I had no partner, and the fourth wad of a teen RX was all to myself. Eventually, I went up to the judges, panicking, asking, is it okay if I go without a partner? And they said yes. So the try hardened me lit the little flame to keep myself going. And when I went up to the starting line to do this next wad where we had to do 50 and 30 and 40 and 50 different reps of all these exercises I've never done before of handstand pull-ups, handstand push-ups, rope climbs, push-ups, muscle-ups. It was all very intense. As I'm going, I'm going by myself. I'm going a little bit faster than the rest of the teams because it's made for you to play off each other because you're going to have at least 100 reps instead of 50 reps, which may seem like a lot, but for a CrossFitter, that's a normal warm-up. As I'm going through these last warm-ups, I'm doing my last few pull-ups, and my hand starts to slip. I fall off the bar, and I think that's my end. I feel like I'm going to break my leg as I hit the ground, but I don't. The judge looks at me and pulls over a box, so I begin to do jumping pull-ups. A little bit easier, but I, it's still manageable. I bring my hands down again and I'm slipping a little bit and I think nothing of it. I already slipped once, it's not that bad. I look at my hand and I'm bleeding. I had officially ripped and all the calluses I have been training for for the past two years have decided to leave me. Just like my partner did that evening. <laughs> and so, I am now thoroughly crying but I have four more reps so I have to finish that off and as I finish, I decide that is my end. I am going to go home, relax, and cry. My hand is hurting as it's never hurted before, and this is also my writing hand. I'm going to have to try to tell my teachers why I cannot write for the next two weeks. And as I call my dad to come pick me up so I can pull the skin that is disgustingly still on my hand off, 
I decide I am hungry. I am very hungry. And what is better than when you're screaming and crying to now have Burgerville? So we go to Burgerville, we get some sandwiches and some milkshakes, because that always makes you feel better when you're holding the cold milkshake in your hand. And as my dad is eating a sandwich and I am crying and cursing to fix my hand, he asked, are you okay? No, I was not okay. That came to an end, but now I realize I can go to this place where I can just talk and be myself and feel okay after a long day has come to an end. Okay, can I do the big reveal? Guess who her partner was? Anna. <laughs> and the funny thing is, as I mentioned before, um, when we come in and we start workshopping the stories, Jordan had come in with this idea of this epic day where she thought, all done, that was the end. and. Um, I need something to make me feel better. Let's go to Burgerville, Dad. Um, so she has the story in mind. And when she walked into the room to see who else was going to be part of the story slam, <laughs> there was part of her story. So we made sure everything was OK with um, her telling that story about um, the day that Anna decided, oh, we've, ha we've done enough, enough CrossFit and um, she was going to go home. <laughs> and I had to ask what was a wad, because their team name was Oh My Wad. And uh, that stood for workout of the day, yeah. right? Yeah. So um, and if you don't know our teacher, Kendra Gardner, um, she does really push her students to their physical limits. <laughs> we have agreement. Okay, are we doing well? Good. Okay, so, um, oh wait, now I have to remember what. Let me share with them in this. Okay. Oh, that's right. And I'm like, you don't have to miss that. So I asked the next student, what will you miss from the Marshall campus? And they mentioned the maker space and i said i know you're leaving this one behind but i'm pretty sure they have an awesome one planned at the new campus so you don't have to get too concerned so let's welcome to the microphone the now um happier leo all right all right there's always the feeling that you are going to die uh, turbulence on an airplane, uh, going down a extremely terrifying roller coaster, or doing a very hard CrossFit workout. <laughs> but um, my feeling of going to die was bleeding all over the floor in Japan with no contact with my parents, and everyone is freaking out. <laughs> Let me back up about six hours. We are in Japan. It is um, Ikuno City. Um, and I am in the Japanese magnet program here at Grant, which before was, um, I went to Mount Tabor and before that Richmond. I study Japanese for over 10 years and I still do to this day and plan to continue to study Japanese for as long as I can. <laughs> now, um, one of the most memorable moments of JMP is most definitely the eighth grade Japan trip where a group of eighth graders um, still figuring out what to do with their lives go all go to Japan together and have a good time. <laughs> now, um, we started off in Hiroshima, um, where we visited the Peace Park and um, did a 1,000 crane ceremony, and everyone just had a moment of silence for um, the people who have passed away from the Hiroshima atomic bomb. And um, after that, we spent about a week in Hiroshima and then spent the second week in Ikuno City. Now, Ikuno was a lot more fun in the sense that everyone treated you like a celebrity. Um, everyone knew that there was this yearly trip where a bunch of white kids came to Japan and could all speak Japanese. Now, this is just the craziest thing because they'd all take selfies with you. They would all ask like, 
they would ask, well, they would t- ask to take your picture. Like, I mean, they, we were in the newspaper, on the news, and we had no idea what was going on. <laughs> and now, every day, we would go to a different place in a group of five. Um, I, being in the best group, gold group, um, went to Ikuno. Um, and Ikuno uh, is a place where it was built during the... Um, Hey, um, the Heian Jidai uh, back in the 1800s and um, was, is still standing to this day. Now, we take the train for about an hour and reach Ikuno and learn um, we can't find where we're supposed to go. <laughs> um, now, we are supposed to find a place where we make soba. Uh, soba is a cold brown um, clump of noodles that you eat with raw eggs, soy sauce, green onions, and honestly, anything else that's very tasty. Um, now, we are searching for about an hour, and eventually we find this little shop right on the outskirts that um, is just the greatest place on earth because it is very hot outside, walking in, the cold air conditioning, cooling our sweat, making us just feel better is the greatest feeling ever. Now, we are led into the back where a man wearing all white is showing us how to make soba. I am with my study partner, Nathan Perkins, and we are um, shown to the floor, tatami mats, which are bamboo mats, bamboo mats where you just sit on your knees and do everything there, no shoes. We are given a rolling pin, a um, cutting board, dough, water, and a very, very sharp knife. <laughs> Now, this knife is about the size of a brick in the sense that it will go past your hand and will pretty much, it's a deadly, it's a deadly object that we're giving to a bunch of 13 year olds. And um, it ended very well. <laughs> um, we learned how to make the dough, fold it, roll it out, and we're told to cut it in a specific way. Now, my Japanese still being not be the greatest, I heard to cut it one, mil- uh, one centimeter. However, um, one millimeter was the correct size, and my study partner, Nathan Perkins, got very angry at me and decided, hey, why how about this? Give me the knife, and I'll show you how it's done. I say, of course. I start backing up. He starts getting ready to cut, and terror strikes. <laughs> um, I get cut in the leg. And I sit back against all everyone's backpacks and just go, guys, I am bleeding. <laughs> the man dressed in all white, showing us how to make soba. His hands are on his head. He looks like he just killed someone. Nathan is in the bathroom, retching his guts out. And I'm sitting there thinking, this could be the end. Thank you. Okay, now do I have to do the reveal (laughs) for that story too? So um, we found out later that the cut was too, how how far did it miss your, and here, if anybody comes to Trivial Lunch tomorrow, here's an answer to one of the questions. (laughs) How far away from your femoral was it? Two Two inches in. So, um, and I know there's a parent in the room tonight. <laughs> I just wondered what that phone call was like um, because I can't even be across town from my children without worrying um, if they're all good. Oh, no. You found out after he got home at the airport with the leg in a bandage. Nice. Okay, how are we doing, judges? Let's back up. I'm remembering what he's going to get. Right. Okay, so uh, our next storyteller, uh, the, the thing that they are going to miss the most from being in this location, um, this part of Portland, is the proximity to Best Baguette. Um, where they dined this evening. So please welcome to the microphone, Ellen.
The first time I remember seeing my father cry was a Tuesday. I know this because in fourth grade, the grade I happened to be in on this Tuesday, we turned our homework packets in on Wednesday and I had to explain to my teacher why mine wasn't finished. Now flashback to when I was about three or four years old, I had a very interesting preschool teacher named Cindy. Cindy had a farm and sometimes she brought in small farm animals for us little children to interact with. One time, she brought in kittens. My sister and I fell in love with these little cats. They were the greatest thing we had ever seen. We begged our parents <laughs> to adopt one and eventually they agreed. I remember uh, one summer afternoon, we all sat in the corner of our backyard and we tried to think of what we were gonna name this cat. We argued for a long time, I'm sure, and eventually, came to the conclusion, Sunflower Black knows Ayame Lovery. Lovery, because that's our last name, Ayame, because that's my sister's name in Pig Latin, and we thought Pig Latin was the coolest thing ever. Black nose, because there were two cats we were considering, one had a white nose and one had a black nose, and we had to, you know, tell them apart. Um, and Sunflower, because my lovely mother had planted sunflowers in our garden, and I don't know, I guess that's just what we chose. So, Sunflower Black Nose Ayame Lovery came to live with us. Now, she had many other names because Sunflower Black Nose Ayame Lovery is too much for any person to say, um, the most popular of which was Sunny B, which, looking back on it, could have been her rapper name if she had chosen that as a career. <laughs> but she was a cat, so probably not. Uh, Sunny B. I think she thought she was a jungle cat because she liked to go hunting a lot. She would chase bugs and small birds. Sometimes she killed them and brought them back for us. That was not a good time. Um, one time, she brought a live mouse into our house. This was a crazy afternoon because this cat was trying to kill this mouse and my mom was trying desperately to get it out of our house. Um, we named the mouse Mrs. Frisbee, because that's the only appropriate name for a mouse. Um, and eventually, Mrs. Frisbee ran into the basement and we never saw her again. <clears throat> I don't remember a time before Sunny Bee lived with us. Like, I vaguely remember getting her, but when my memory starts, Sunny Bee is there. And so, in fourth grade, it was a little concerning when she started to lose weight and she stopped running around as much. <laughs> and she started taking naps on top of the heating vents in the basement because they were warm and she liked that. And so on this Tuesday, when I came home from school, I went down to the basement and I got her from on top of the vent and I went up to the living room and I just sat with her for half an hour and I think in the back of my mind, I knew that her time was coming to an end, that she didn't have much longer. But, you know, I ignored that thought and just sat with her some more. So when my dad came home that day, he took her to the vet. And when he came back and I went downstairs and I saw the tears in his eyes, I knew it was over, that she was gone. And my parents told me it was going to be okay, and I didn't believe them because Sunny Bee was basically my favorite person in the world, and she was not a person, she was a cat. Um, so it was difficult for me to come to terms with this. But time passed, and I, you know, I'm okay now. We have a new cat, her name is Snickers. She's great, and though my love for her doesn't replace Sunny Bee in my heart, you know, it doesn't make her any less special. And so the point is that good things come to an end, but without those endings, there would never be any new things, and those new things aren't necessarily better than the old ones, but it doesn't mean that they're any less special. And I love Snickers, but I'll always love the memories I have of Sunny B. Thank you.
got Terry again. Thinking of my cat. I didn't share this with y'all the first time we heard that story, but uh, like Ellen, when I grew up, I had a cat, and, and I have no memories at all before this cat became part of my life because we got her when I was a baby. There's a picture of me pushing her around in a box when I'm a little baby. And she lived to be 17 years old. She died when I was a senior in high school and it was the most devastating thing that happened to me um, that senior year of high school. Um, how many people have read Pet Cemetery? So, uh, sort of like Danny, how do you give a send off to uh, really something that's become part of your family? And my dad didn't want to mess with the legalities of trying to dispose of said family member. And um, we didn't go bonfire route. No, he put her in a box and buried her in the backyard. And a lot of my students can tell you that my favorite author, the author who got me through the horror of high school was Stephen King. Uh, so when I read Pet Cemetery after the passing of Scooter, it was quite terrifying because anytime something scratched at my bedroom window, I thought it might have been Scooter come back from the backyard. So I, I feel the loss, though, of Sunny B. All right, our final storyteller of the evening um, has a spot in Marshall that they're going to miss once we head back over to Northeast Portland. There is a particular window on the seafloor. I'm going to be checking this out tomorrow. To, to verify said story. Uh, it looks west, so you can see a lot of trees, and every day there's different weather patterns going by, and this student really enjoys going up there, not during class time, no. It's during passing periods, right? Lunch, right. Uh, to look out the window, and take in the beauty of um, the Pacific Northwest. So please welcome to the microphone, Anna. All right, so some people in their lives really absolutely need their screen time, but for me, I need something that I like to call my green time. I need to get out under the trees with my feet on a trail and just walk and all of my stresses just disappear. My favorite place to get my green time is in Portland's backyard, the Columbia Gorge. Um, but two years ago, I thought that the Columbia Gorge was going to be gone for good. Um, two days, a couple days before this happened was the happiest day of my life. Um, it was a hot August day in Portland. We had some friends visiting from Madison, Wisconsin. They're twin boys about my age named Guy, um, Gabe and Isaac and their parents. And they wanted to go out for a hike. So I was like, all right, cool. Um, so I wedged myself in the back seat between the twins and we drove out to the gorge and I took them to one of my favorite spots, which is Eloa Falls. If you don't know Eloa Falls, it is amazing. Um, the trail takes you winding through the woods and then it turns a corner and opens up into this like natural amphitheater. Um, there is like a bowl shaped formation um, at the base of these two hills that come together and a giant cliff with columnar basalt. And right in the middle of that cliff, the waterfall plunges like almost 300 feet down to this blue pool. It takes your breath away. Um, so me and Isaac and Gabe, we walked down to the pool as close as we could. I mean, you're this close to the waterfall, you were just getting blasted with wind from the force of the water hitting the pool, with mist, with just this roar that just strips away everything. So we were standing there, just exhilarated with this, getting blasted with water and sound, and 
I looked to my left, I looked to my right, and I looked at these good friends of mine, and I was so happy to be showing them one of my favorite places in the world. Um, so after we went on this hike, um, it's not the, a summer day without ice cream, so we stopped at this little ice cream booth at the base of um, Bridge of the Gods, which I swear gets more business than any ice cream booth at the state fair. Um, and we ordered an ice cream cone that was so tall that they had to bring it out the back to us. They couldn't hand it through the window. And we drove home, and I was so happy. <sighs> A few days later, everything changed. I think everyone in Portland remembers the day, September 2nd, 2017, because it is the day that a teenager dropped a firework into Eagle Creek Canyon and the entire gorge became an inferno. Um, I remember watching like a, a fast motion footage of the fire as it just consumed everything that I loved. It um, destroyed all of the trees on the Oregon side and then the wind blew sparks across the river and it devoured the Washington side as well. I was horrified. Um, I imagined the gorge, just this moonscape, not a living tree left, the streams, the clear blue running streams just choked with ash and mud and fallen trees. Um, in Portland, it felt like the apocalypse was nigh. Um, the sky was this dirty gray, and falling from it were little bits of ash all the time. Um, this lasted a week. My birthday is September 7th, and I remember being so depressed on my birthday that year because like, it was just horrible outside, and I was imagining my favorite place in the world just destroyed. Um, <laughs> it felt like my life was ending. I think the entire city was mourning the loss of our backyard. Um, the sun was this big, weird red circle in the sky, like the eye of Sauron. Um, <laughs> um, it, di it wasn't funny at the time. Um, <laughs> and I was just imagining this utter destruction um, for months and months, because that was how long it took for me to be able to get back to the gorge again. Um, and I finally got to go back in the spring of 2018 of last year, and I was kind of scared for what I would see. Um, I still had this like uh, desolate moonscape picture in my mind. <laughs> and we got out there and we went on this hike called Hamilton Mountain on the Washington side. And during this hike, um, you get to this panoramic viewpoint on a cliff where you can look up and down the gorge and even see the tips of the mountains. Um, and when I got to this, um, this point, I was really, really surprised because I could see green. And that just made me so happy. It, I realized at that moment as I looked up in the, down the gorge and I saw trees and bushes and living things that the Eagle Creek fire wasn't the end. Uh, was only a new beginning, a new chapter in the life cycle of the gorge, and it meant that I could go back and re-explore all of my favorite places over again. Thank you. That was the first year we were here at Marshall, and I think that kind of just contributed to this feeling out of sorts of being in this new place and um, not getting to settle in, um, but glad that you've gotten your green time back. <laughs> I, on the other hand, love my screen time, <laughs> but I am glad that Anna has had the opportunity to get her green time back. All right, la da 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 da. Here we go. <laughs> All right, so um, we want to say thank you to the following storytellers for sharing with us tonight Danny, Jordan, and Leo. Thank you. And we have some special treats for you. Thank you very much. Our runner up for tonight's story slam is Anna. And that means our winner tonight is Ellen and her tribute to Sunny B.
thank you all. Um, every year I, I always hold my breath and hope that there'll be at least four or five storytellers that want to come out and be a part of this. And my students have yet to let me down. So I, I thank you so much for being here tonight. Thank you to our audience members for choosing this artistic event. And hopefully next year we will not have to compete with the musical. All right. Thank you guys. Have a nice night and enjoy your Friday tomorrow.